Hello, everybody. My name is Harvey Brownstone, and I'm thrilled and delighted to welcome author and playwright Lee Tannen. Lee has written one of my absolute favorite books entitled I Loved Lucy, My Friendship with Lucille Ball. Welcome, Lee. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. Thank you for asking. Your book deals with your friendship during the last decade of Lucille Ball's life, roughly from 1980 to 1989, correct? Yes. Now, Lucille Ball doesn't need any introduction. She isn't just a star, she's a megastar, a legend. I can tell you, Lee, that uh, she is my absolute favorite uh, entertainer of all time. But your book is a very personal memoir. It's extremely poignant, very touching. Can you tell us why you decided to write it? Yeah, first of all, I love, love, love the picture that you chose to have on your screen. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous shot, which isn't seen that many times, but that's a really beautiful shot. She was probably in her mid fifties during that. I think that shoot was done in her backyard in Beverly Hills anyway. Um, when I turned 50 in 2000, I decided that I really wanted to sit down and just write some memories of what had taken place from 1980 to 1989. I was getting older and people were asking me all the time, what was it like and what are the things you did and how was she really and what was she really like and blah, blah, blah. In so, other words, all the questions I'm going to ask you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which <laughs> makes it much easier now than it did in 2000. Um, so I just sat down at this well, not this exact computer, but a computer. And I just, um, I don't sleep very much. So I woke up real early every morning and I would just kind of write down random notes. And I had about 50 pages of it. And I showed it to my partner and just his memories, you know, and he said, you know, I think you have a book here. And I said, well, no, I don't think so. Who would want to read a book by a totally unknown author that, you know, no one's heard of. And he said, well, that's true, except that you're writing about probably the most famous woman in the, in the world. And so the that most beloved woman in the world. Yeah, that, yes, I, I, probably in that order, beloved and famous, because you're absolutely right. And uh, so that led me on to write another, literally 250, 300 pages, whatever it is. And um, I was doing some freelance work at the time and I knew somebody who knew Sue or somebody who knew an agent and he looked at it and within a week we sold it to, uh, to St. Martin's Press and it became a bestseller um, right away, went on to do paperback, but I, I I wrote it really for that reason. I wrote it as a, as a as a as a mnemonic device for myself, as a memory for myself, so that I was able to kind of remember the things um, that we had done. And I didn't realize sort of the arc of the book until it was until I had finished it. And of course, working with a great editor at St. Martin's Press, and um, so that's how that's how it evolved. Now, you um, also wrote a play based on the book, which I, had a very successful run in London. I did. We had actually three successful runs in London. London is very much like New York, where you have Broadway and off-Broadway. In London, you have the West End and off-West End. And um, there were two producers who I had never heard of, who through Facebook from London called, emailed me on Facebook and said... Uh, uh, that they had read it and they, they thought it would be an interesting thing to uh, to produce. So I went over to London and we did a reading and then we did it uh, at a small theater uh, called German Street Theater in London, two runs. And then it moved to the West End uh, where we had a very successful run as well. And now there's some movie interest, same way, you know, some movie people contacted me through Facebook and said, wow, I think this would make a, a really lovely film. Well, can I ask you there, um, what is it about that last decade of her life that um, is so memorable and would make such a good story? Uh, oh, you're asking great questions already. Uh, well, the, 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 the most salient point about that whole thing is that, you, you know, I mean, it, there have been lots of stories about Lucy and Desi and Lucy and Ricky and there's been a couple of biopics and I know there's a third one in the works and um, and of course there's interest in her grows and grows exponentially 30 years after her death. What I'm excited about and what the people who were involved in hopefully this little film that we're going to make is that this is a unique story. This is a story about a woman in the last decade of her life, the last act of her life, um, pretty much lived out of the spotlight. And unless you read my book 
And really, I have to say, unless you singularly read my book, because even all the other books that have been out, I've always been by people who really barely knew her or, or didn't know her at all. And they all kind of dealt with those Lucy Desi years, you know, and right. I think there's something really, I'm very excited about being able to put this out there, you know, out on the screen for people to see what she was like in those last 10 years of her life. Well, I, I agree with you. Uh, I, I think I've already said your book is my favorite book about Lucille Ball because it is so personal. Um, the story of how you met her, I understand that uh, she married uh, Gary Morton, her second husband in 1961, and you're a distant relative of Gary's. And I love the way how you say in the book, um, in Yiddish, we would say, say you were mishpucha. Uh, if you're not Jewish, you would say that Gary's sister, Helen's husband, Bob, was your father's first cousin. But I love the way you just kind of negate all of that and say she was uh, mishpucha, she was family. You met her a few times briefly when you were an adolescent and a teenager, but the real friendship started in 1980 when you were 29 and she was 70, correct? Uh, 29 and 69. Yeah, yeah. She was she was she was going to be 70. I was going to be 30 later in the year and she was going to be 70 later in the year. So this fascinates me. I mean, you're a creative director at a theatrical advertising agency in New York. You were obviously a huge fan of hers long before you met her. Um, can I ask you first, uh, why were you such a fan of hers? Well, I guess the question I can ask you back, why is anybody such a fan of hers? I mean, her-, her... Well, um, I think people have very specific reasons. I can tell you that in my case, um, I was very badly bullied as a kid. And um, uh, I Love Lucy played on TV every day at 4.30. And I knew that if I could just get home from school in one piece, I would get to watch Lucy at 4.30. And she was an escape, the laughter. Um, and she became, a, I felt she was my friend. Wow, that's, that, that's, that's great. You know, I've, I've heard hundreds of, hundreds of people telling stories about what they loved about Lucy. And yours is really beautifully said and very poignant. And uh, I, I had similar, I, I wouldn't say I was bullied, but in, in, in the play I write, I talk about uh, a, a, a friend of mine, a childhood friend of mine, who you know uh, couldn't be my friend anymore because uh, uh, he he said I was a fagala, another another Yiddish word meaning gay or queer, and when I was nine years old and that struck me and um, Lucy also for me was a kind of like to watch her every day and to laugh and but but I think. Um, Yours, thank you for being so personal about yours, but I think well, in general, I think why millions and zillions of people love her to this day is because she was brilliant. I mean, her comedy was brilliant. And again, you know, you have to give credit to the writers and the directors and the co-stars and everybody else, but she, her, the comedy itself was so timeless and universal that I think people who were, weren't even born when she died are Lucy fans today. So um, I like the bullying. I think that's really, um, well, it's, it's just very, it's very personal. Thank you for sharing that. My real, what I'm really interested in, what do you think drew a 70 year old woman to this 29 year old um, young man from New York? Wow, I tell you, I wouldn't have to pay my psychologist and my analyst if I knew you 20, 30 years ago. <laughs> And another another great question, and it's a question that we're actually in the in the process of exploring and trying to um, take this book and, and and adapt it for the screen. Because well, you know, um, you don't really explain it in the book, Lee. You explain very clearly how you were completely blown away at the thought of meeting her and then being invited to her home, and how you, in your own mind went from being an awestruck fan to uh, a really a confidant, a very close and dear, dear friend, uh, someone she really loved and took into her most inner circle. But what's less clear is why did she befriend this young man? She saw something in you, Lee. 
Well, it, it's, it, God, you really, I, I'm, I'm not being facetious here. Your questions are just, are incredibly um, spot on. Let me just- I'm say, just getting started. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I'm, I'm, I know. I'm, I'm a little, I'm getting a little nervous here. Um, interestingly enough, I, and I just said it to a couple of people, friends and also colleagues who I'm working on the film with, that if I had written this book, 20 years, like now, if I had written this book now, you know, let's just say I wrote this book now, I think this would have been a very different kind of book. Um, one reason why it, I held back a bit in the book was that my mother and father um, was, well, not my father, my, my father had passed away, but my, my mother was still living. And it, it's, it's not that my mother, um, uh, was upset about my homosexuality or anything like that. But my mother's name was Lucille and she also had red hair oh. and, she, and she tended to be a bit jealous because I spent a lot of time with Lucy that I would have spent ordinarily with my mother in those last years. She and, was a Jewish mother. Yeah, yeah, she was. And, and so I, I, I'm not using this as an excuse, but I, I think I held back because of certain ex external forces I also held back, I think, because I, I don't think I understood it at the time, but I think now as an older man, kind of looking back, because now I'm the age basically that she was when we met, which is a right. very, very strange uh, phenomenon in and of itself. Yes. I, I think, um, yeah, and you're right. I make very, uh, not, I don't make light of it, but it becomes a very kind of like, oh, so you're gay, you know, so you're gay. Of course you're gay. So what? You know, that was easy to explain. And it might have been from her point of view, from, from my point of view, I actually told her that I was gay. She was about maybe the second or third person that I actually told I was gay way before, way before I had uh, uh, actually told my parents. And way before I told closest friends, which you tend to always, you know, something very serious about yourself, you tend to tell maybe strangers more than you would tell your closest friends. And she was so um, she was so accepting of of who I of who I was. And she, she loved your partner Tom. And she loved my partner Tom. She was a strange. Strange might be a strong word. She, she wasn't particularly close with her children at that particular time in the, in the 80s. Yeah, I'm going to ask you about that. Well, but on the gay issue, um, the, you know, the, it's interesting you compare her, or you, you, you sensed perhaps a bit of maybe resentment on your mother's part. But when I read the book, I didn't get the sense that she was trying to be maternal with you as much as being a very good friend until the part where she tells you to be careful, she doesn't want you to get AIDS. Uh, at the end, of, at the end, which is ironic that at the end of the book, yeah, toward the right, back in 1988, 1989. That was very maternal. I, well, yeah, yeah, I, I wanna get back, I wanna answer a little more, you know, uh, forthrightly and honestly about the, the, gay, the gay issue. Um, I, 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 th I think, like I said, I think she had used to be, she was used to being around a lot of gay men in Hollywood and a lot of gay men, particularly on the set of I Love Lucy at a time when, when homosexuality, you know, was considered still a mental illness by doctors, let alone coming out. So she, but she, but she was very, she was very simpatico with, with, with gay men. So it was very easy for me to, to be around her. I, I felt if I would say more in the book, it would have been just more about her total acceptance of, of who I was. And I, I, I never, I had a, I, I was always lying to people about my life because if you lie about your sexuality, I think you're lying about your life. You know, I think that's of like, course. That, that's, that's, that's numero uno. And I never had to lie to her. I never had to, whether it was with my partner or whether it was just, just in general, what it was like we talked a lot. We talked a lot. Again, it's not in the book, but we had many nights and many late night talks about, you know, what it was like growing up in the Bronx in the 1950s and how I couldn't be gay and how I knew I was gay.
from the time I was eight years old, from the time, like I said earlier, that this friend of mine said, I can't be friends with you anymore because you're, you're, you're a fagula, you're gay, you know? And so I had to hide behind that and I dated women and I ran on the track team. I got married even, if you know, in the book, I got married and, you know, to my childhood sweetheart and, and lasted seven years and it was seven years of a complete lie and a deception. So I think when I, when, when I met Lucy, it just like the floodgates opened up. And for her, I think the floodgates opened up because I'm not sure that you mentioned about being maternal, the things she said, yes, about not getting AIDS and that. But Lucy was, I think Lucy was very maternal right from the beginning, even though I don't, again, I don't talk about it much. I think she saw in me a lot of what she did not have with her own son. And that's no, that's, I'm not pointing fingers. That's nobody's fault. It's just mothers and sons have a certain dynamic. And we, 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 we didn't have that dynamic because we weren't biologically mother and son. So, you know what I mean? We sort of had, we had the best of both worlds until later on in our relationship when I kind of overstepped and I became sort of like her son and we had a big fight and, you know, all that for anybody who hasn't read the book, go read the book. All right. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to leave. Uh, 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 if people want to know about that, I think they should read the book. Yeah, that's what I, I just see. I want you to know that as a someone who's read your book at least three times, um, because you have to understand, Lee, and I'm sure you do, that for fans, reading your book is the closest we will ever come to really knowing who she was when we were growing up. Because many of us uh, were not alive when she was doing I Love Lucy. By the time we knew who she was, she was divorced and, and had, she had moved on to the Lucy show. So the Lucy that you write about is the Lucy that was alive during our time, is the Lucy that we saw on TV specials and we saw in Here's Lucy and so forth. And so just so that you know, I actually think it did come across very clearly in the book that she was gay positive. Because very early on in your friendship, you introduced her to Tom, your partner, who she just adored. And um, so I just, if it gives you any comfort, I understood very, very clearly from your book that she did very much accept that you were gay. Good. And, that, I, and, and I think she saw something in you. I think she saw, I think that she, you, you describe her as someone who's very sensitive and very perceptive. And my suspicion is that she sensed um, a neediness in you and felt protective towards you. That's the impression the book gave me. Oh, I, good. I, no, I'm glad that that, that that is how I felt. Again, I, I'm, I'm very proud of the story I tell. And I think it's a complete story. And I think when people read it, they'll really, they'll, they'll really get it. Oh, I, yeah. I wish I would have just, just for my own personal, just delved a little bit deeper into my feelings of her acceptance of me and, and, and my feeling of being so, I, I said to, uh, some, to, to somebody just the other day that I, I never have felt more authentic. I use the word authentic, even with Tom, even with any friendship uh, is, to this day, I have never felt more authentic than when I was with her. Just well, totally authentic. Whatever you didn't say in the book, you're saying in this interview, which is going to be very widely seen. So I'm glad that I had the opportunity and the privilege of hearing you say these, uh, express these emotions, because I think um, I think she'd want you to. And I think it's very validating for all of us. But one of the fun things about the book, your relationship with her was the fact that you made her rediscover New York. You didn't just play backgammon with her. And for those who didn't know this, Lucy was addicted to backgammon and pretty much kept Lee uh, and Tom prisoner in her home many times and in hotel rooms playing backgammon. But then Lee, you got her to go out, to go to see shows and go out for dinner. And she got an apartment in New York. And I think all of that's because of you. Yeah, no, that, 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 that's true. I mean, when I, I spent a lot, a lot of time out in Beverly Hills and a lot of time in Palm Springs, just because those are the places where she lived. And um, even though she wasn't working, she was just very content really to be out of the spotlight and to be home with her little, you know, gathering of, of, 
of people playing backgammon, mostly not in show business, you know, so I wasn't, I wasn't starstruck because I really, I remember in the book saying once I was there nine days and I never met anybody, a star <laughs> except Peter Falk walking down the street or something like yes, that. You did. Um, but when she decided to come to New York and she loved New York, Lucy loved the seasons. She loved, she was born in Jamestown, New York. So she was born in, in upstate New York, freezing cold weather, lots of snow. She loved that. She, she really, if she had her druthers and they could have filmed in New York all those 25 years, she would have definitely lived in New York. But she, she loved, loved New York. So when she decided to come to New York, first to stay at hotels, and then she decided, you know, I really want to spend a lot of time with Lee and let's get an apartment. So we got her an apartment. I said to her, I was not going to be what I think you refer to a prisoner of paradise in Beverly Hills. I said, this was my city. We go out to dinner, we go to theater, we go to movies, we do things because I knew deep down inside she loved doing them, but she was afraid. She was afraid because she was very cocooned in Beverly Hills and in New York, you're, you're out there. The irony of it is, is that in New York, you can walk around pretty much anonymous because that's what people do in New York. Whereas in Beverly Hills, you don't walk at all. So, you know, so it was all that. So yes. So when she decided to move to New York, I said, these are the things we have to do. And she, she fought me. One of her favorite words in the English language was no. It was very easy for her to say no. She would say no to things before you finished a sentence. It was just whatever. It, no, 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 well, no. Somehow she said yes to you. There's a, uh... There's a very poignant part of your book where you've, uh, by now you've convinced her to go to see some Broadway shows and you go to see La Cajo Fall on Broadway. And of course, Lucy's the most recognizable face in the world. She's recognized and the audience goes wild. And you got to see her soak up all that adoration from those thousands of people in that theater. Yeah, it was actually on my birthday. It was, I think my, it was November 10th, I think it was 1983 or 1984. And we went to La Caja Fall, we went to a matinee. And um, at, at intermission, she kind of never, she never got up much in intermission because she really didn't want to cause a stir. And her not causing a stir, let me just be clear, it wasn't an ego thing with Lucy. It wasn't because, you know, she, she, she didn't want to cause a stir because she never wanted to take the spotlight, if you will, away from anybody else, whether they were in the show or whatever. So she sat, she sat in intermission at her seat and I kind of stood guard over her and, you know, and then, but somebody must have caught a glimpse of that flaming orange hair from up in the second balcony. And right before the lights went down, somebody yelled out, we love you, Lucy. And I, obviously people knew she was in the house and the place went crazy. And she turned to me as the lights were going down and said, what should I do? I said, stand up and take a bow. And she did and the house lights went back up and you had like 1700 crazy screaming people. And she got the biggest standing ovation of the, of the day. When we went upstairs <laughs> to see Jean Barry afterwards upstairs in the dressing room, he said, what was all that commotion going on in intermission? And Lucy just shook her head as if like she didn't know. But, but, <laughs> right. then, but then finally, I think it was George Turner, somebody said, Lucy, you got quite a standing ovation. And Jean Barry said, yeah, almost as much as I did. And Lucy said, without missing a beat, no, I got more than you did. <laughs> and that was, that was, that was an incredible, inc every time we went to the theater, it was incredible. Every time we went to the theater, every time we went to a restaurant, it was incredible because people, it wasn't like sort of like an Elizabeth Taylor thing where people would rush her and kind of like, this was like, people were so respectful and they almost didn't realize it was her until they took like three looks, four looks, because she didn't even expect Lucy to be in New York, you know? Right. So it was, it was quite an experience. Yeah. So she had, a, she had, a, once she finished saying no, she said a lot of yeses and we went to lots of theater and lots of restaurants. Well, I think, uh, she didn't just enrich your life, you really enriched hers. And now I've got to ask you the question you've been asked a million times, I'm going to apologize in advance, but it has to be asked, what was she really like? Her daughter, in her endorsement of your book, described her mother as unique and complicated. Is that fair? Yeah, that's very fair, yeah. Everything that Lucy said in the back of that book, which was absolutely lovely and lovely, lovely sentiments. Yes, she was complicated. She was unique. Um, she was nothing like Rick, Lucy Ricardo. Well, I say in the forward of my book, 
at the beginning, and I can't quote it verbatim, even though I have the book right here. Um, the, my first notion was when people asked me, like you just did, and people asked me that all the time, what was she like? My first inclination was no way. She wasn't like Lucy Ricardo at all. I use Lucy Ricardo as the kind of, you know, because that to me, she'll always be Lucy Ricardo, regardless of the whatever incarnation she had afterwards. Um, but the more I thought about it, she was a lot like Lu Lucille Ball, Morton, Goldapp, or whatever you want to call her. She, she, she needed to be the star in her own way. And so did Lucy Ricardo. She was able to manipulate you, if you will, with tears like Lucy Ricardo would do. She, would, she was um, not intentionally funny because she always said she didn't think funny. She said, Lee, you think funny. I don't think funny. She said, I deliver the goods, which I once said to her, FedEx should be so lucky delivering the goods. But she wasn't. She, <laughs> she really well, she wasn't. She said in uh, a very well-known Q&A session that she did at the Museum of Broadcasting in New York, she said, I'm not naturally funny. I can do funny things that other people write. But exactly. in your book, it's clear that she had a wonderful sense of humor. She loved to laugh. And um, she did funny things. You, your, your descriptions of how she tried to cook are hilarious. Or your description of the way she drove is very much like Lucy Ricardo. But you see, but those were, un those were actually, un you know, it, the way she drove on Isle of Lucy was scripted right down to the, the, the way she cooked on Isle of Lucy was scripted. These were unscripted, unintentionally funny things. So there's where she was like Lucy Ricardo, but she, but she wasn't. She had a great sense of humor. She loved to laugh, but she really loved to laugh at funny people more than, you know, deep down inside, this was a very, very serious, very, very serious woman. I think that's what Lucy Arnaz meant by complicated and unique, very, very serious, um, really didn't think, she really did not think funny. And it's important she did. Now she was able to tell a story. I would say to her one, you know, my favorite thing was tell me a Clark Gable story, you know, or something like that. And she would play Clark Gable and she would play Carol Lombard and she would play herself and she would, she would act it out. No one could tell a story like Lucy. In that way, she was funny, but that, but that was a, a comic genius of a more of an acting kind of thing. Right. But, but she didn't. She was a good like, raconteur. There, oh, the best. But she didn't. She wasn't quick like I was quick, like I am quick. She just wasn't. I mean, she. And if she was, she hit it pretty well. But I. But I really believe that she was not inherently inherently funny. And the people who worked with her described her very much like you did. Um, all business, serious, needing to be in charge, in control of every situation. Um, and so that's very consistent. But you go beyond that in your book. You gave the impression that she was actually quite needy. She didn't like being alone. No. No, she didn't like being alone. Um, I use the word abandonment. She, if, if you read her whole story and you know her whole life, which you, won't, which you really won't know from my book because it's the last 10 years, although if you're intuitive, you'll see that these last 10 years kind of mirror the first 65, 60, 65 years. She was abandoned very early on by her father dying when she was three years old. She was then abandoned by her mother who remarried to a man who didn't like children. So she was raised by her grandfather. She was abandoned many times in her life. This is again, this is my take, you know, but, but it's a, I think it's a, a take based on knowing her so well. Um, my God, her abandonment, Desi's abandonment of her nearly nearly killed her. I mean, that was the biggest abandonment of her life. Well, it was the most public too. The most public and the most humiliating and the deepest because this was a love affair of the ages. That was a love affair until the day he died, until the day she died. But her abandonment kept on going on. And then finally, when her series at the end of her life, that ill-fated life with Lucy, you know, uh, was canceled, that was a total abandonment. And she felt then that if, if she was canceled and fired, that nobody loved her anymore. And they couldn't quite, I, I tried to get through to her. I, everybody tried to, that they weren't, they did not love her anymore. They just didn't love that character anymore. Right. So she, she was, she was needy. And in a, in a, 
it's a strange word. I, I, I keep on going back to, she just, she, she, she didn't like being abandoned. Is, is, yeah. uh, more she than won, that. And you, you really kept her company and you made yourself available despite trying to, to work in a busy career. Um, and the, the other thing that I think people need to really understand is that she was humble. She didn't sit there watching herself on television. Oh, she was very humble. And she watched herself on television occasionally. I would be, every morning when I was out in Beverly Hills, I would just, I would have my little breakfast and I would take a video VHS, that's a, you know, VHS and put it into the machine because she had them all on a, on a row, you know, and I would put a, an episode in and then I would read along. She had the scripts all beautifully bound in leather and I would read along. Can you imagine watching I Love Lucy and Lucille Ball's house? I mean, no, I can't. I mean, no matter who you are, can you imagine? And once in a while I would feel her presence. She would come in and she would stand behind me. I could feel it, you know, you know, with a star, there's electricity, you know, you, you know that, you know, somebody walks into a room, if they're a star, you just, you know it, even if your, your back is to them. And so she would be in back of me and I would, I would turn to her and look at her, I'd go, oh, Lucy, that, that is so hilarious. And she'd go, shh, don't look at me, look at Viv, look at Viv, she's the one. If you want to learn about comedy, baby, look at Viv, never, 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 um, she knew, she knew what she was. So she didn't need that. She didn't need that um, validation, you know, from anybody. She knew how brilliant she was. And because she knew how brilliant she was, she allowed herself to be humble. Now, I was surprised to find that her favorite I Love Lucy episode was the Queen of the Gypsies. Yeah, she had 10 of them. I think I mentioned it in the book at the end. Yes. But, but the favorite is the, uh, that that surprised me. I love it too. Um, I was just surprised it was one of her favorites. There were so many to choose from. Another aspect of her personality that you've uh, highlighted is how generous she was with uh, upcoming talent. And she was so appreciative of her fans. Very appreciative of her fans and very, very willing to, to speak to any young person about uh, what, what it was like in the business. She also loved having an education. She was very strong about having an education because she never had an education. She never even finished high school. So one year we went to Harvard. She was a woman of the year. Hasty Pudding has this woman of the year. And she gave a whole seminar to these, to these Harvard kids about how important it was, even if they wanted to get into the business, to stay in school and to get degrees and to you, you know, but she was, yes, very, very, very willing to, to, to help people. And she was constantly approached by fans everywhere she went and almost never refused to sign an autograph. I, there, there's lots of stories. And I really would love to set the record straight because they're, apocryphal is too nice a word. They're just lies about her. You read stories and I, I don't know where they come from. Things like, she would not look a stewardess in the eye. You know, when she flew on a plane, she would make sure that the stewardess didn't look at her, you know, look down, or she would tell somebody else to tell the stewardess, or thing, crazy things like that. I was with her so many times in so many different situations. I never, ever, 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 ever saw her once deny an autograph or a hello, and, and her favorite thing, if somebody said, let's say you met her, and you'd say, hello, Miss Paul, which you might say, she would say her stock answer was, my friends call me Lucy. And that I thought was like the, the best. And, and most people did call her Lucy because, you know, the, she was a TV star, not a movie star. Again, you know, I, I think, if, I think if, if you saw Elizabeth Taylor on the street, you wouldn't say hi, Liz, or hello, Elizabeth. You'd say hello, Miss Taylor. But Lucy was in your living room every day, and she was Lucy. She was Lucy, you know, and she loved that. So that was a big thing. So I, I really, for everybody, anybody listening, she was no bad stories, nothing, nothing like that. I never saw her being disrespectful to any fan, never. No, I think it's, uh, it, 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 there are enough uh, people out there who witnessed how she was with her fans that can verify that. Uh, I have to say to people, um, we can't obviously cover every scenario in the book, but there are wonderful moments that Lee writes about with Lucy, not only in New York, but in Snowmass, Colorado and Palm Desert. Uh, there's a wonderful description of what happened at the Kennedy Center Honors in 1986. Um, but, you know, Lee, we have to leave something for people to read for themselves. So I'm going to move on if that's okay with you. Um, you're the boss. 
I just want to ask you uh, about Gary Morton. She married him in 1961. Let's, let's move on. <laughs> really? It's that No, bad? no, no, no. I'm, I, I'm only half No, kidding. I think I, I, we have to cover it because you do in the book. And um, I just think it's important for people to understand um, where you're coming from. Uh, my understanding, you correct me if I'm wrong, this man was never a success in his own right. He was at best a borscht belt comedian. Um, you gave the distinct impression that you didn't like him. The obvious question for me is, do you think she was happy with him? Yeah. Um, I think, in the, hmm. it, it, and I'm not, I'm not hedging. I'm, I'm absolutely willing to, 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 to speak the truth. Uh, well, you must be conflicted because if you weren't related to Kim and he had not married her, you would never have known her. Yeah, that's true. She so let me know You that. owe him that. She let me know that once too, when we were in the midst of having this big estrangement. She let me know that in no uncertain terms, and it, and it, and it's true. And so, yeah. So for that, I give him one percent credit. Um, the well, other, is it fair to say that he was what she needed at that time? He was exactly what she needed at that time. She really could have. I mean, you know, you hear stories, and they're really mostly true. People like Henry Fonda and others were crazy about her, crazy oh. about her, and. He was available at that time. He could have married her in a minute if she said yes, you, you know, but she didn't want somebody like Henry Fonda. I mean, he even said, you know, if we marry, we can call our company Fonda Lou. That was like a big, <laughs> that was like a big thing. She said, no, nothing. But she, she, she wanted somebody 180 degrees different from Desi. And I'm, I'm being serious now. And when I mean that, and, and the good aspects of that were somebody who can give her a home life because she loved being at home. Somebody who and be faithful and be faithful and be home with her and be faithful. And that was about it on that. On the, good side. on the other side, she, she wanted somebody who, God, I've never said this before, and I'm trying to be very careful with my words, but I believe that she really wanted somebody that she could control because Desi was the total controlling force in her life. Yes. In both positive and negative ways. I had never had the pleasure and the honor of meeting him, but this was a man who deserved so much more credit than he got for and I'm segueing a minute into Desi. I'm not, I know your question is about Gary and I'll uh, get And I will get to Desi, don't worry. And I, I, but, but I mean, he was so responsible for the success of her success, of the show's success, of tons of comedy shows that we know now with three cameras. I mean, that was, that was all, that was, he was just brilliant. Well, the whole idea of filming a show so that there would be reruns is his. Right, right. Right. So I wanted to, so, but, but in stepping back, so when, when he humiliated her and she finally, you know, she filed for divorce first time in 1944, way before they even had their fame together. And yes. uh, unfortunately she went to bed with him the night before she went to court. And that was the end of that. That's true. Which shows never go to bed with your husband the day before you're divorcing him. It's a sure way to change your mind in the morning. Um, but well, if but, they hadn't but, done that, we wouldn't have I Love Lucy. So I'm glad exactly. they did. Exactly. But by the time she married Gary, she just wanted somebody who she could really, under her thumb, you know, he was 35, she was 50. She was incredibly successful, incredibly famous, incredibly rich. He had none of those things. He had very little polish. He wasn't particularly bright. He wasn't particularly good looking. Even as a gay man, I found him totally asexual and sexless. So, um, but he was willing to be there sure. and make her the center of his life. And without her, he was going nowhere. Right, but that, was, that, only, that, but that only lasted so long. You know, once she got him started and he became a producer and he warmed up the audience and she gave him titles and she gave him money and she gave him clothing and she gave him cars and she gave him country clubs, great. But as the years went by and by the time I got into the picture, 20 years by then, it was, I didn't see a lot of love there, to be honest. I didn't, I, but, but, you know, I certainly didn't see a lot of passion and I didn't see a lot of love. And I saw once I came on board, uh, he would behind my back call me the babysitter, which, you know, did not endear me very much. And, but, but it gave him permission to kind of go out and play golf and go here and go there and 
hang out with his buddies. And I think that was okay with Lucy because I was there, you know. Uh, yeah, that, that, you know what? You hit the nail on the head. As I was reading this book, I kept thinking, where's Gary? How is it that this young man um, is with Lucy all the time and Gary's never there? He's always at the golf course or uh, uh, he didn't want to go to the Broadway shows and do the things you did. Oh God, he hated New York. So he never went to New York. Very but, rarely went to New York. But the thing that made me resent him the most, which I don't think anybody really knew until you wrote this in the book, is that he gave her bad advice. He gave her bad advice. He got her to fire the chauffeur. Uh, you had a great plan for the Black Gamma ad for uh, the mink coats. Uh, the Night of 100 Stars, she was one of the few big stars that weren't there. You were going to do a wonderful HBO documentary about her, and he talked to her about it. You know so much. You know more about my life than I do. Scary. That's my job. And, <laughs> and, and he was responsible for her disastrous return to television with, in uh, Life with Lucy uh, in 85, 86, which devastated her. And those are my reasons why I resent the man. Well, yeah, just think you weren't even there. Um, <laughs> I can you imagine what it was like? Because these, these were, I mean, some of them were my ideas. Some of them were just, you know, how do you he, he, take the Night of 100 Stars, which was not my idea per se, it was Alexander Cohn who, who wanted to do this thing for the Actors Fund. And what turned out to be what was Night of 100 Stars turned out to be almost 300 stars and one of the most successful fundraisers ever in New York City. And it was a monumental night of the most glamorous stars all in one place, all at one time. Uh, I, I, I was glued to the television set for that whole thing. And Gary told her, well, this is pretty much verbatim, Gary told her, no, no, Lucy, don't do this because it'll be, you'll be, your absence, seriously, he said, your absence would be more conspicuous than your presence. I have no freaking idea what that meant, but she listened to him. She, do you she, think she listened to him to give him some sense that he actually mattered? No, I think in this, in some case, no, I don't. I think, I think her natural tendency, as I said earlier, was to always say no. So oh. he gave her the out of saying, if saying no. That's an interesting conceit, though. I don't know. That, 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 that could be. That could be. Well, I, think I guess what I'm saying is uh, if she felt he needed to have a, a, a little bit of an ego where he actually had influence over her and that he could be in charge, why else would you make him producer? when he had no producing talent. You know, why else would you give him these titles if it wasn't to help him save face? Oh no, I think early on, you're talking about early on, I think, I think she, look, I think she wanted to make sure that he had money, his own money. I think, I think she needed, I think she needed him to be his own man. I, I don't think, I think she, she didn't want Hollywood to think that, that look what, look what she's picked up the street and, you know, so she gave him things to do that would make him learn the business and at the same time give him some independent wealth, you know, which he had. He, he, he accrued quite a lot of money working for Lucille Ball Productions. But your, your point about mattering, that that could be at the beginning. But I think, again, by the time the 80s came, I just think he just gave her lots of bad advice. And I think it was, um, the worst advice was the show, was, was, was yes. going to Life with Lucy. I want to get into that, uh, Life with Lucy. This was her final television series. It was canceled. I was shocked to find out in the book that there are five episodes of that show that never even aired. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you write in a way that's really heartbreaking uh, to see her so badly surrounded by, you know, bad writing, bad plots, bad everything. Um, my, my thought, I think she should have been one of the Golden Girls, that she would have been great in, a, in an ensemble. Well, he turned, he, he, she was, she was, I mean, this might be a bit apocryphal, but I don't think so. I had heard that she, pretty much she was offered it. And, and, and he said, no, I don't want you to, you, 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 you work alone. You don't work with other, with other women. Yeah. She would have been, she would have been great. Oh, there are many things she could have done. I mean, she could have also just done the whole college 
you know, going out and speaking and to these kids. She was great at that. These Q and A's. She didn't need the money. She just she could have she could have just been out there with young people who would who would have adored her. I mean, think there was that, a there was a a, a well known television critic when when Life with Lucy came out. He panned the show like everybody did, and he said, "If Lucy would just start being Lucille." This would have worked. Is that Richard Shales you're talking about the Washington it Post? It could be, but he said for a 70 year old woman to be acting like Lucy Ricardo, it's not funny anymore. Yeah, she was more than 70. She was like, you know, she was like 74, 75, you know. Well, yeah. I, I'm glad you were there to help her get over the, if she did get over that terrible disappointment. She never got over that. You have to remember the three things that happened in those 10 days, which are really seminal 10 days that I think is part of the part of the decade and part of the story that we tell and hopefully part of what people will see in the film. You know, she got fired from ABC on a Thursday. Desi died of lung cancer the following Tuesday. And then five days later, she got the Kennedy Center honor. Could you imagine those three incredible things happening in the span of 10 days? And even the Kennedy Center honor was so tinged with heartbreak and, and with bittersweetness in the sense that Desi, was not given the Kennedy Center honor. I mean, he, yes, he died five days earlier, but he should have posthumously gotten that, especially in that year, Hume Cronin and Jessica Tandy, this kind of husband and wife, you know, brilliant couple of the theater, they got it. That's what I meant when I talked about earlier that he never got the recognition. It should right. have been Lucy and Desi who got that. That would have made, that would have been an amazing thing for her to, to, to have him get that. Award. Well, let's talk about Desi. Just before we do, just for the just to complete the topic, uh, for people who don't know, Gary Morton uh, remarried in 1996 and died in 1999. Uh, and you've mentioned in your book that uh, after Lucy died in April 1989, you you saw Gary once and then never again. Right. So on to Desi. You've made it clear in the book that Desi Arnaz was by far the true love of her life. Um, am I right about that? Absolutely. Now, um, but it's also clear in the book that she had very conflicting feelings about him. You mentioned a time where uh, you're in a restaurant and she's telling total strangers about his infidelity. But on the other hand, she praised him profusely and would say things like, without Desi, there would have been no Lucy. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I think I, I think that's part of, again, Lucy Arnaz's, you know, the complication of her mother and, and, and the, the conflicts in her mother's life. Um, if, for instance, I don't talk about it in the book, I think, but there's a thing that stick was, sticks with me to this day. She was doing a Barbara Walters special and Gary and her were sitting with Barbara in her backyard in Beverly Hills. And yes, Barbara I remember it. And Barbara Walters is, is, was the best and could get anything, you know, from anybody. And they started talking about Desi and she called him a loser. She called Desi a loser. That caused a lot, a lot of people to really, really um, not take that very well. After it aired, I spoke to her about that and she realized what she meant See, Lucy, a lot of times, Lucy would just say something very quickly, you know, knee jerk and say the, the wrong thing. What she meant by a loser was that he had to lose, meaning the more successful they became, the more he drank, the more successful they became, the more he was infidel, the more successful and the more houses and the more studios they built, the, the more um, abusive he became. That's what she meant by a loser. He didn't know how to win. You know, he didn't know how to win. But in the, in the, in the um, well, the interview, what I'm saying the word loser to all of us when we say somebody is a loser. I mean, I can always say that, almost say that about Gary Morton before he married her. He was sort of like a loser in the general sense means somebody who's just not successful and not this and not that. Right. They're a loser. So, but when she, when people heard her say that, they really thought that was a very insulting thing that she said. So she would say things like that. But to me, she never said anything but the highest praise. And I don't think she ever mentioned him without crying or without tearing up. I don't think in all the talks we had about Desi, and we had a lot of talks about Desi over the backgammon table, over the dinner table. Anytime she spoke about Desi, you could just see her, her welling up. And especially but, but, uh, the welling up is because of the hurt. 
and because of the love that she still felt, but there's also the professional respect. That's gotta be a very difficult juxtaposition of emotions for oh, us. Can you imagine? And interesting that you say those two things. I, if I had to put them in order though, the welling up was the love, I think more than the hurt, with more than the hurt. I mean, they were both then, there was no question, but I think as time, she always said, well, there were, there were two things, and it's important to understand their, their, their relationship because it was, their relationship was so complex. For Desi, his drinking was one thing. That was not good. But his unfaithfulness, his father did the same thing and his grandfather did the same thing. They, they went out. They went out with women. They went out with whores. They did. They admitted it. But, they, but he never didn't love Lucy, and he couldn't understand. They, the men in, those, in that in that in that way could not understand why the wives would be so upset. They didn't, didn't mean anything. They were just whoring around. Didn't mean At anything. that time, that may have been the mentality. I hope it's changed uh, for everyone because uh, it's yeah. very disrespectful yeah. to a spouse. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, I want to be clear that this is not Lee Tannen's. This, this is not my... <laughs> no, this <was> Desi Arnaz's <laughs> yeah. perspective. I think um, in his own book, he makes it clear that there's a difference between love and sex. Yeah, and that those affairs were all about sex, and Lucy right. was all about love, and he and it, and in his mind they were completely, um, you could they could coexist, but the problem for Lucy was it was public, and he was embarrassing her. That was it. She told me once clearly that if they had not been in the public eye and famous, she probably never would have left him. She now I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, and so again I'm not you, you know. Please, we everybody can't, We out can't there. judge. We can never judge yeah. another relationship. We don't no. know the no. dynamic. But I really it. believe, I really believe that it was a love of the, for the ages. And I, and I have a feeling that if they weren't, if they weren't famous, I think somehow they would have survived it. They would have survived it. Now, I'll tell you, I want to move on now, Lee, to her children. Um, I'm fascinated because and I hope I'm not getting this wrong, but the impression you give in the book is that Lucy was not close to her children during the period that you were very close with her for those nine years. Um, as she saw them infrequently, and yet uh, her daughter Lucy endorsed the book. Well, if you notice, that, that, um, and I want to be very upfront about this and very, and very candid with you, um, I'm very hesitant to even now talk about the children. And those are for very personal reasons that I don't want to even get into in any, and I never have in any interview. All I want to say is that if you notice in the book, I hardly talk about the children, hardly talk about them at all. I think you can count the number of times that Lucy and Desi Jr. are, are, are mentioned in the book. But when you do, you describe her as emotionally shut down. There's a sense that she was remote. Uh, you make that very clear, at least on one Christmas. She it, absolutely, she was remote. Um, I said earlier in the interview, the estrangement might be a too strong a word, but they were not close at all at that period. When Lucy died, little Lucy, as she's called, Lucy on that little Lucy, just when Lucy was d dying in April of 1989, they had just begun to a kind of rapprochement of their relationship. Desi Jr. was a whole other thing because he was he was into a lot of different drugs and living a life that was just Lucy couldn't abide. So they they had really some tough some tough times. Then he went into survivorship and into these programs, and their relationship I think got better also. I think unfortunately their relationship with their mother it sounds crazy, is almost better today in retrospect, even though she's been dead for 30 years. I think they've come to understand, they've come to understand a lot about what it's like to live in the shadows of parents that are so, so famous, especially a mother, especially a mother. And all I will say is that naming your children after you when you're <laughs> so famous People don't talk about that much, and I, I don't want to, I'm not going to extrapolate too much, but with, just think about that your children's names are Lucy and Desi, even though the spelling is different, obviously, of Lucy. Your children's names are Lucy and Desi, and you're growing up under that kind of cloud, if you will. 
I think it's very, I think it's very, very, I think it's very, very tough. And I do say- in Well, the especially group, that Lucy was trying to establish her own career in show right. business as well. Right. So I Mr. think Lucy. that's, that makes it harder. You know, if Judy Garland had named Liza Judy Garland the Jr., it makes it harder. Yeah. Yeah. And Liza, it wasn't easy to begin with. So you can imagine exactly. I, I, I think I, I, it was, it was, it was complicated. The reason why I think Lucy loved the book so much is because I told a lot of hard truths about her mother, but not necessarily, if you realize it, if anybody who reads it, they weren't necessarily hard truths about her mother and her relationship. They were just hard truths about Lucille Ball and how she was with people in general and what she was like. I mean, that was the, you know, that, that wow. she, she saw that. You're, you're, um, you're right. I just think it's an enormous, I don't think you really get, Lee, what an enormous credit it is to you to be able to write a book about such a person. And all of us know that Lucy Arnaz is incredibly protective of her mother's legacy. We see that all the time. And yet, you know, you were able to say, you know, Lucy was emotionally detached. Um, she didn't have her own children at the Kennedy Center Honors. You were there, they weren't. And yet Lucy Arnaz endorses the book right on the cover, at the back cover, and says, people should read this. Yeah. No, I, I think that's an enormous credit to you, especially that you, uh, you mentioned in the book that Lucy didn't even like her daughter's husband, her son-in-law. Intimate Larry Luckinville. Yeah, uh, maybe she grew to like him, but. Uh, oh, did I say that? I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, you said in the book that she never, she, she didn't like, uh, he was older than her and she didn't like him. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, I, 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 I absolutely agree with everything, but, but, but I, but I and, and, as, and as we moved forward in the play and as hopefully we'll move forward in the film, um, you know, film is different than, than a memoir. So, I mean, I can't vouch for exactly what's going to be in this film, but I think, I think respect will be paid all around and discreetness is, 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 is very important because, because the book is so truthful. You know, the, I'm, I'm, the book is just, the, I really want to be clear about that. You know, whatever you other books you read, or again, what other films you see about Lucy and Desi, whatever, Nobody was there at the time. Nobody was, they're all gone. So you can't ask anybody about them, you know? I mean, but the, the book, the book, that book is just, it's, it's just, there's no hearsay. There's yeah. absolutely, there's no hearsay. I, everything in the book, she told me, I didn't even have to even overhear. She told me, she just told me and I told her. So I think that's- well, you know. And that's why of all the people that claim to be experts about Lucille Ball, I came to you because I know that. I know that's exactly correct. And the sincerity, the authenticity of, of the book, um, the kindness, the compassion that you show, even though you're not afraid to show that she was a real person with, four, you know, with flaws, with demons, um, it's very heartwarming. And for a real Lucille Ball fan, I think it's essential. I don't think you can ever really appreciate her as an artist if you haven't read your book. That's how strongly I feel about it. Thank now, you. Um, very, very uh, nice. I wanna ask you uh, about her career during the 80s. Um, you mentioned that she didn't mind being typecast as the Lucy character uh, on I Love Lucy and the Lucy Show and Here's Lucy, but you say that it was a mixed blessing because she couldn't really be accepted doing anything else. Yeah. You know, she always said, and this is this is what's so troubling, and this is why Gary, I blame almost 100% because he so talked her into this, and it was all about money because they were paying her a lot of money to do this series. She spoke so much in private and in public. She always would say, I would never go back and do this again after she retired, like basically in 1976. How could we top what we had? How could we top, you know, I mean, she even said that after I Love Lucy, but she went back and her, her other shows had a definite modicum of success. But as far as going back into situation comedy, she said, how could I ever top this? How could I ever do this? So Gary thought if he got back her, got her writers, you know, Bob and Madeline, if he got her and got Gail Gordon out of retirement. I mean, Lucy was so insulated by that time that she didn't know that 
TV had passed her by, if you will. Comedy had passed her by. Situation comedies were totally different in the 1980s than they were even in the 70s, you know. And so because she was home and she didn't know really what was going on in the public eye, he was able to talk her into something that was so that was so ill-suited. Now, I have to say one thing that's interesting, though, about Lucy. When she used to talk to, to kids, especially actors, and this goes even today, young actors today, they always talk about how they don't want to be pigeonholed. They want to stretch. They want to play a mass murderer here, but then they want to play light comedy there and whatever. And that's like a big thing. I, Lucy was just the opposite. She did like 68, 69 films in Hollywood, and her career started going downhill because they didn't know what to do with her. They didn't know, she, you know, she started and she had a modicum of success and she had things like the big street and she had some other stuff going on. But then by the late forties, she was the queen of the bees, they called her, you know, these bee movies. She was looking for the one thing that she could pigeonhole herself that she could, and she found it in Lucy Ricardo and she stayed with that and she stuck with that. So I always gave her so much credit for that but you got to know when to get off. And she didn't know when she knew she did know when to get off. And then Gary made her get back on again. Now, um, a lot of people don't know that Lucy wanted the lead role in Driving Miss Daisy that Jessica Tandy ultimately got and won an Oscar for. Yeah, I took Lucy to see Driving Miss Daisy down down uh, when it was off Broadway. I, I, that was that I, so we, we went to see Driving Miss Daisy and we went to see Steel Magnolias. That was another film that she really loved. Um, and she wanted to, she, I, I think she almost did Pocket Full of Miracles on Broadway. Well, that, that, that's a whole long story in the book. That was something that I got involved in. But unfortunately, um, I think she would have been a great Apple Annie, you know, but, and, and she wanted to do that, but the rights were all tied up and ultimately that never happened. I have to say Driving Miss Daisy, I mean, I appreciate that Lucy wanted it, but I don't think Lucy was right for Driving Miss Daisy. And I think Jessica Tandy, deservedly won the Oscar. And so it was the year actually that Lucy died, ironically in 1989. But she loved, the, she loved the show and she loved Steel Magnolias also. But Lucy did go on to uh, do a TV movie, Stone Pillow. Now you weren't very present during that period, but it seemed to me that that wasn't well received. The public really only wanted to see Lucy playing Lucy, don't you think? Yeah, that, that's the conundrum. You know, they, 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 they did want to see Lucy play Only Lucy, and it wasn't a very good script, and she got very sick doing it. So it was really a lose-lose situation. But you see, with the, with the reruns, she didn't have to do another series. Kids that weren't born yet were, wa and were watching I Love Lucy, and yes. we're watching The Lucy Show, and here's Lucy everywhere, all over the world. So you're right, they wanted her to be Lucy, but they didn't need her to be Lucy at 74, 75 years old. All they needed to do was turn on the TV, Channel 5, whatever, wherever you live, you know, and they were able to see her. So Stone Pillow was a, mis was a misfire because, she, right, she was playing against type. Something, again, she knew better because she found her niche in 1951. And there were plenty of films. She was offered, again, Gary, bad advice. She could have, she could have found light comedy. She could have found the way to be Lucy in the early, you know, when she was in her early seventies, but not with this Gail Gordon and this crap that they passed off for, for a retread of, you know, another Lucy show. Are there any uh, other books about Lucille Ball that you would recommend, Lee? I mean, I think your book is the only one that will give us a real view a real inside view into who she was as a person in her later years. But are there any books that you like that uh, cover her career and that you feel are accurate? Well, Kathleen Brady wrote a great book. I forgot the name of the book, but it was a big, big, uh, right around the time my book came out, it was all you know, biography. Um, not really. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, again, there, there are many, many books. If you Look, if you want to know about Lucille Ball's life, there are many, many books about Lucille Ball's life. And if you really want to know about the Desi Lou years, Tom Gilbert's book on Desi Lou. I mean, there are many, many books, you know, and, and there's two television films that, that came out. And there's a, there is a wonderful uh, American Masters called, I think, Finding Lucy. Yes. Um, all good, all good about her whole life. 
unique is I Love Lucy because again, last 10 years, the real woman, the real woman. And if you're smart enough to take that story and just realize that nobody really changes that much in the last decade, you know, we don't change when we're 70 years old. You're able to read between the lines, if you will, yeah. and see that what I saw in the last 10 years was just the culmination of what her life story was. So again, I, I hope it works. Do, do you think it'll be, do you think it could be an interesting film? Be honest. Do you think- I can't wait for you to make that into a movie. I don't know who would play Lucy. We don't know uh, either yet. <laughs> but I've got to tell you, uh, I think that there's, it's, uh, it's layered and it's complex because there's a friendship there with a young gay man who was clearly reaching out, who had a vulnerability that she picked up on. And there was a loneliness on her part because she had a husband who was uh, really not an emotional support. I think he was there for a good time. And, um, and the chemistry, the fact that you made her see this whole other world in New York, you got her to meet fans. I mean, she wasn't approachable in Hollywood uh, you couldn't walk down the street, North Roxbury Drive, and see Lucille Ball cutting the lawn. Um, but you made her, uh, you gave her a chance to see fans um, and hear what the fans had to say about her. Do you? Well, think I, I think I, I made her real, is what I did. Made I made her real, but you made her accessible. Accessible, real, yes, and and, and obviously iconic, of course. But, but accessible is a great word. It's totally accessible. You made her accessible. Do you think she really understood how beloved she was? I mean, at a deep level, did she get it that people absolutely adored her? Well, that's the, that's the crux and almost the, 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 the end of my story in, in the sense is that I, I think she knew, let, let me just break it down. I think she knew how famous she was. I think she, she got that. I think she knew, uh, humility aside, she knew how famous she was. She knew what she could do, what she couldn't do. That's why she was hesitant about going out in New York. She knew. This is important to listen to. By the time at the end of her life, her public and her private persona was so tied up together. Again, I go back so that when I, that when Life with Lucy was canceled, this is so important. She absolutely believed that people did not love Lucille Ball anymore. They, she, she, they were so tied, they were so inexplic inexplicably tied that I tried to, I mean, you want to like shake her and go, Lucy, the world, I, I do, I think I say it in the book, I certainly talk about in the play, the world loves you. They just didn't love your show. It's really as simple as that. She couldn't get that. She could not get that. She died at 77. She could have lived easily another 10 or 15 years doing such wonderful things. That show, and then I don't know if you know, there's a, there's a little bit, there's a, Richard Burton came out with his diaries and he said some horrible, horrible, horrible things about her. We tried to keep her from reading the book, but she read it and she saw that. So anything like that- now Just that to, 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 to explain to people, Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor appeared on Here's Lucy uh, on an episode uh, revolving around that very famous diamond ring of the Elizabeth Taylors. And uh, Richard Burton wrote in his book some very unkind things about what it was like to work with Lucy on the set. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, very, 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 very unkind. Like, you know, like I loathe her and I hope I never see her again in my life. And then, yeah, it was a couple of pages long. And, um, but again, that's all tied into the notion that she just, I don't think she felt, I don't think she felt the love anymore at the end. I really don't. I think she just was very confused because her work was everything. And she knew that after this fiasco, she wasn't going to work at all. And then Desi died and then blah, blah, blah. And then she was started having her own health issues. So she, did she feel loved? I, I hope she did deep down inside, 
but you know, she died alone in Cedar Sinai Hospital, you know, and it's. Well, you said in your book that she died because she was ready to go. She wasn't that old. Why, why did you say that? Why was she ready? It's funny, Lucy Arnaz wanted to know that also. Um, well, I certainly mean she was ready in a kind of, look, look, I, I again, Lee Tannen's opinion. I'm not a doctor. I don't, you know, I think when people's hearts are broken, and I think her heart was truly broken, the combination of the lost show and losing Desi, because I think she started dying the day Desi died. I really believe that. I really believe that, that her heart was so broken in two, you know, in pieces, actually. I think she just didn't want to live anymore. And then from a technical point of view, when she was in the hospital and the doctor came into the room when she was starting to feel better and they were going to transfer her to a regular room, she was talking about going home and the doctor said to her that he didn't think she'd ever be able to go upstairs anymore in her house. She had this beautiful bedroom that she adored. She loved mauve and purple and she had pillows. And it, was just, it was a gorgeous bedroom, gorgeous. And he said she would never be able to go upstairs anymore because of her heart. They would have to build something for her downstairs. I know that sounds like, oh, well, you're not going to die because somebody says that. But I'm telling you, I know this woman enough to know that if she couldn't live the way she wanted to live and she had nothing to live for in terms of the way she felt, the way she felt, I don't think she wanted to get old. I think she wanted to check out. And I believe that you could will yourself. I do think you can will yourself to die. Again, I think Debbie Reynolds did that. Well, when Carrie died, I said to, I forgot who I said it to. I mean, you didn't have to be a genius. I said, I think I said it to my partner. I said, you know, Debbie's going to die real, real soon. Never thought 24 hours, but it's, it's, it's like that. You know, she had a ruptured aorta, she was getting better, but I think, I just, I just don't think she wanted to live anymore. I just, I, I it's just, just my opinion, just my opinion. Yeah, well, um, your opinion is more valid than any of ours because you knew her so well. Um, I've got a tough question for you and I promise we're almost at the end. You've been incredibly patient um, to give me all this much time, Lee. You're a fabulous person to talk to. Well, thank you. My question yeah. is... Only as good as the interviewer. I mean that sincerely. And you really, as Lucy would say, my God, you have done your homework. I'm afraid of this last question. I can't even imagine. I mean, I told you everything about me, short of, well, forget about that. Go on. <laughs> my question, and this is just my... Um, when I got to the last page of the book and I closed it and I hated to see your book end and I can't wait for the movie and I want to interview you again when the movie comes out. You promise me. I promise. Um, what do you think Lucy would have thought of your book? <laughs> well, the, the, the little funny scenario that it's really not funny and I hope people take it in the spirit that I'm giving it. The book was published on 9-11. Truly 9-11, not 9-11, 9-11, 2001. The book was, because books are published always on Tuesday. They always come out on Tuesday. And I was so excited about this book coming out. And I was so, even the night before, there was a little pre-publishing party that I had at a friend's house or whatever. So when 9-11 came, I remember looking up and I'm going, Lucy, if you didn't want me to write this book, I mean, you went a little bit too far. And, I, and, I, and I'm only saying this in, in, with all due respect to all those people who died that day. But the serious answer is, I think she would have loved this book. I do. I think, I, 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 I wouldn't have written it if I, I mean this sincerely. This, this was not, this, this was not, you don't get rich writing a book like this. And you don't get rich doing a play like this. And I'm not going to get rich doing a movie either. This is, this is a legacy that I want to keep alive because, because there is so much that, people don't know. And I think every, and I've gotten so much fan mail over on so many lists still to this day, and people are still buying the book and I've done the audio book and they buy, they listen to the audio book. To this day, two things I hear from people is they really feel like they've spent time with her, like truly have spent time in her room, in her place, you know, not just, you know, and, and the respect and the love that I've given her and shown for her 
with the warts and all, with the foibles, like Lucy says, like Lucy says at the end, and I will quote, you know, I know you said you wrote it for you, and yet it will help many, many people, including me, to know Lucy and understand her better, deeper, and fear not, we will love her even more because like us, she was only human. And that's that's how that's that's how I that's how I feel. So I think I I I think I think she would have loved it, and I think she really would have loved it because because it's smart, because the book is smart, because it's funny, and because I was there. Because I was there. I think Lucy had problems because there were there was much that came out about her when she was still alive. And her, she always had problems with people who wrote things about her who never met her, who didn't know her, you know. So I think I, I think she would have, you know, she might have said, Jesus Christ, kid, did you have to say that about that? Or, you know, oh, but you something like to that. But I think in general, I think she would have taken it to bed with her with Tinker and had a good had, had a good time. Tinker the little dog. Think her a little white toy poodle. Do you think there's anything about um, her personality or her work or her legacy that are misunderstood by the public? Well, I, well, I mean, God, we can we can go on for hours about this. So I'll keep this short. I mean, I think what's mostly misunderstood is this notion that she was this great businesswoman, and that's a long drawn out thing. But the truth of the matter was. She wasn't a great businesswoman. She was forced into being a businesswoman when she bought Desi out and she became head of the board of directors of Desi Lu. But she hated having to do that. I know that because she told me that. She loved to perform. She loved to make people laugh. She loved an audience. So I think that, it's not a big detail, but I think there are a lot of people that think that, oh, she, now, now, did she break the glass ceiling for women? Sure, she did. She became the first head of a major studio. Not saying, but, but it was by default. It actually was by default. If Desi and her had not gotten divorced, Desi would have gone on to do all the things that Lucy well, even more because they kind of dissolved the studio. So it was really her being forced into that situation. That's good to know because it, she was more interested in the the show part of show business, not the well, business part, the show part. And he was been totally uh, look like 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 he said, like Robert Stack read in this letter that he wrote that they read at the Kennedy Center on a, you, you know. Um, well, first of all, they said, I Love Lucy was, he ended with, I Love Lucy was more than the name of a show. But he said something like, Lucy was the show. He said, Viv and Bill and me, we were props. We were damn good props, but we were props. Lucy was the show. That's who she was. Lucy was the show. And Lucy was always the show. And she was always the show at home. And she was always the show wherever she went. And with along with that show came a certain amount of control and came a certain amount of my way or the highway you know, if you, if she didn't know how to toast an English muffin, you didn't know how to toast an English muffin. If she didn't know that, you know, and that was, but that was, that was Lucy. That, that was, you, sometimes people would ask me during the time that I was with her, Jesus, I, you know, how, how can you, you know, I would tell stories like that. Like she would, you know, we would have a fight about this. That. How can you deal with, how can you take it? You know, she wasn't Rose Schwartz down the hall. She was Lucille Ball. And you, and you take that. You take the good with the bad. And there was a lot more good about Lucy than it was the bad. I miss her every day. And I think about her every day. And I don't do these kind of interviews every day. So thank you for asking me. And... Um, well, Lee, I, the thanks is all mine. You, I cannot tell you how long I've waited. Your book came out some years ago, uh, it was always my dream to sit- 9-11, <laughs> it came out 9-11. That's right. And it's always been my dream to sit down with you and get to chat with you about um, your perceptions. You've been so frank, you've been so candid, so open. Um, you're just a pleasure to talk with. I wish you the best of luck with the movie. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Book, again, as you can see on the screen, I Love Lucy, My Friendship with Lucille Ball. Any serious Lucille Ball fan must read this book. And I hope that this interview has warmed every Lucy fan's heart as much as it's done mine. You are an absolute joy. I, I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart, Lee, for this wonderful interview. You are very, very welcome. I appreciate it. And best of luck to you and keep, keep safe.